Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, new models for culture. We all know um, that cultural models are changing right now in a pretty profound way. Everybody who's been at this conference talking to you uh, or talking with you um, is pretty much repeating the same kind of message as things are changing. We all know they're changing. So the question is how? And it's not really just an adaptive kind of change. It's a kind of change in the, in the kind of fundamental structure of how we do business because the ways in which people are using culture, making culture, interacting with culture are changing in a pretty profound way. So what I'd like to do today um, is talk about what this moment of creative disruption looks like. Uh, then talk about a little bit uh, what this new audience is, who are they, and what the hell do they want. Uh, and then finally, uh, give you five ways, maybe strategies, maybe ways of thinking about interacting with this new audience and um, figuring out how it is that you're going to have a different kind of relationship with them. Because I think at the, at the core, that's really what we're talking about here. So, to set up. The last 50 years we've been in a bubble of mass culture where success in our culture was defined by the mass culture, the ability mostly created by television to aggregate millions, tens of millions of eyeballs or ears around some sort of pro uh, product. And the idea of the mass culture is a really powerful thing. It pervades everything, high art culture, everything. Everybody talks about it. The idea in the mass culture model is not to be excellent. It's to be accessible to the most number of people. You can't be successful unless you sell a million things of one thing. But what's happened in the last 10 years is that the, 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 the most mass of the mass culture, TV, movies, television, music, uh, are all losing audience uh, at a rate of about 40, 50, 60 percent. This is really profound. And what it means is that the business models that have grown up around the last 50 years to support popular culture uh, no longer work. And so you're seeing massive restructuring across all of the creative industries. Kind of makes the, the, the art culture um, the things that we do, we talk about audiences not growing or staying static. Uh, we're doing marvelously well by comparison to what was formerly the, the, the real big giants um, in culture. Um, interestingly, over the last 50 years, um, the icons of this mass culture uh, have attained such power in our, in our minds that we think of them uh, we're still holding on to the, the ways in which we think about it. So you, th you think of a, a magazine like People magazine, which is about as mass culture as you can get, right? We think. But the circulation of a People magazine right now is only about 3 million. 3 million is pretty good, but if you look at a population of 300 million, that's only 1% of the population. That's mass culture? I don't really think so. At the same time, The New Yorker, uh, has doubled its circulation in the last 10 years uh, to about a million. Um, now, that's not 3 million, admittedly, but in terms of relation to 300 million, uh, it's not that much different. Yet we think of people as mass culture, as something really popular, and the New Yorker as niche culture. Not really true anymore. Other successes in the culture of national public radio has doubled its audience in the last 10 years. Um, it's now got the number two and number three most popular shows in the country, Morning Edition and All Things Considered. Of course, you all know what number one is, right? Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> but just by a hair. <laughs> um, in that period, in the 1990s, was the most dramatic expansion of the art, arts culture in American history. We spent more than $25 billion on new theaters, new, new um, uh, concert halls, new museums. It was a huge increase in the amount of infrastructure. In fact, this follows a trend that's happened since the, since the 1960s. In 1965, when the NEA was created, there were only three arts agencies in the entire country. Now there are over 3,000. 
Back then, there were only, um, in, in the 1970, there were only, what, 270, or pardon me, 2,700 arts organizations. Now there are 27,000 arts organizations. There's been a huge, huge expansion in the infrastructure to deliver culture to our audience, what we have thought of as our audience. This is, however, changing. And this chart here, I'm sorry if the people in the back probably can't see this very well, but this is of January, the top 10 web properties, uh, the most popular web properties out there. Um, and Google is number one and Yahoo is number two. But what I really want you to look at is number three, which is Facebook. It used to be that the, the internet was this amazing thing because in the beginning, what it promised, what it actually delivered, was access to any kind of information you wanted. Suddenly, with a click of a button, you could actually get any information you wanted. That's not what people are using the internet for primarily anymore, for information. If you look at that third column there, uh, time per person spent on these sites, you see that Yahoo has, uh, over the course of a month, the average person spends an hour and 23 minutes on Google, two hours on Yahoo, but look at Facebook seven hours. And what we're noticing is that the social networking sites, the sites which are offering interactivity, which are offering community, which are offering relationships, those are where people are going. In fact, uh, a Pew survey a few, uh, last year says that young people report that their online relationships, the people that they know only online, their online community, is as important or more important than the relationships they have in the real world. These are affinity relationships, and they're very, very important to people. That means that we have to think about how people, are in, how people want to interact with us in a different way. They don't want to just come and consume something. They want to come and have a relationship with us. Now, it's important to realize who, who is online. And this is, this is sort of the, the uh, December uh, data, and you can see the younger people are, are more online than older people, but the fastest growing demographic, for instance, in Facebook is women age 55 and older. Um, seniors are the fastest growing uh, demographic on a lot of social networking sites these days. And it makes sense. It's a way to keep track of your friends. The other thing that's really changing right now is that for, for the last 15 years, um, American websites, American internet activity, num the number of people connected to the internet has been the highest in the United States. But as of last summer, China passed us. And um, currently, China is adding broadband customers at a rate of 600,000 people per month. Um, and so you're going to see the complexion of the internet change quite dramatically uh, in terms of who's using it globally. This is meant to be a kind of representation of how we think about our audience, how we label our audience, you know, audience segmentation. Um, we want to find out a lot of things about it. And the ways that we have um, traditionally sought to find out who our audience is and what it is that they want to do is by demographics. Where do you come from? What is your ethnicity? What is your age? Et cetera, et cetera. All these kind of fuzzy ways of, of um, uh, describing who the audience is. But online now, this kind, of, um, this kind of data isn't so meaningful anymore. This is not what online people want to know about. Instead, we want to measure not where you come from or how old you are. We want to measure what is your engagement? What is your behavior? What is it that you do? How is it that you use the things that you use? Because it turns out we can tell an awful lot about what kind of person you are and what kinds of things you can do. And once you know that, then you can start to, to try and guide that activity in ways that are important to you. So it's broken down now. This is kind of a standardized thing. This is a chart from Forrester Research. Um, it's broken down now into about to, to these six categories. You have creators, people who are on the web making movies, making web pages, putting pictures up, doing all sorts of things out there. Critics, people who are um, commenting on those things, criticizing, you know, interacting. 
collectors, people are going out and just bringing back stuff and using it for their own, uh, for their own uses. Joiners, people who want to be part of a community. Uh, spectators, people who are part of a community but aren't necessarily the people pushing the relationships in those communities. And then finally, inactives. And inactives doesn't mean that they don't use the internet. It means that they go there and they're not interacting in a, in a, um, a, a very robust way. And you can see across the demographics here that the, the inactives are mostly older people. But the middle part of that chart, the social networking part of the chart, that's where it's fat with young people. That's where the future is. People want to have interactions. So if your idea of the world looks like this, what it really is is looking more and more like this. And it changes every night. Now this is a graphic back from 2007. And you can see um, up here, MySpace. Look at how tiny Facebook is down here. Right? So this is constantly rearranging. But this is the useful way of being able to describe our audience online. And increasingly, it's predictive of what the audience is going to be offline. Now, lest we um, get too carried up in this idea that, hey, everything's online and we should only pay attention to people online, it really is important to understand that there are a lot of people who never go online. This is from, what, two months ago, March? And I want you to take a look at the, the second from the bottom here. It's the active digital media universe. That's the number of people who went online some point in the last month. It's 197 million. That means out of a population of 300 million, fully one third of people in this country are not going online. That doesn't necessarily mean that they don't behave in similar ways. But you can't talk about the online audience and assume that that includes everybody, because it doesn't. This has really profound implications all across our society. We notice it in the arts with critics disappearing and coverage declining. This is a graph of um, media outlets accredited to Congress. And if you look back there in 1985-86, there were 550 um, uh, wire and newspaper outlets accredited to Congress. Flip up to 2007-2008, and it's just slightly over 150. This year, it went below 100. That means that there are many, many fewer professional watchers, journalists, paying attention to what Congress is doing. It's even worse in the state houses. In Washington State, where I come from, uh, a decade ago, there were more than 100 people accredited to, to go and pay attention in Congress, journalists. This year, there are six. That means a lot of stuff is going on out there that we don't know about. OK, so I really hate when people talk about technology and they don't connect it up to what's happened before, because this this element of change, this thing of, of changing uh, how the economy works, is an ongoing process. We invent and reinvent and reinvent and reinvent. And there's always something going on. For a long time, the way you became a powerful economy was to manufacture things, to make things. right? Then in the 1980s, we discovered that you could make things anywhere. In fact, it's cheaper if you ship them offshore. right? So we became. Um, a service economy. And uh, we had lots of jobs at home. Um, somewhere in the 90s, corporations figured out that everybody was making products. There were more products than ever before. And what could really distinguish you, if you had an excellent product, was the experience. So everybody started selling the experience rather than the product. Right? You don't sell a BMW by telling people, how many horsepower it has, you show the, pic the glamorous picture and then a wisp of smoke. People know what that means, right? We are not, it's also how Starbucks manages to charge five bucks for a cup of coffee that costs them 10 cents to make, right? It's the experience of being there. 
we're not really in the experience economy anymore. We're in something that people are starting to call the, the uh, attention economy. The attention economy is a challenge. If 10 years ago you had a choice as a, as, as a consumer of five or six things that you might do on an evening or five or six products that you, you know, kind of liked, now you have thousands of choices. And I defy you, if you're making one product that's on the bottom shelf in the third row there, how are you going to get the attention of all of these people who, who feel overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that's coming at them day after day after day? This happens for products, but it also happens in culture, anybody who's making cultural products. It's partly why the season tickets and the, the committing to things in advance doesn't work so well anymore because there's so much choice. And in fact, there's a whole science growing up around this culture of choice. So the idea is, is that if you are trying to sell your piece of culture, your concert, your whatever, as a consumer product in a traditional consumer transaction, right? I'm going to sell you on the merits of this particular show. You're dead because if I have a thousand choices just to get through those choices, I'm not, I don't even have time to consider the merits of what it is that you're doing. There has to be something else. So the, the, the more interesting approach that I've seen recently is people talking about turning the attention economy into the intention economy. The intention economy means that the consumer has a relationship with you, has an intention to have a relationship with you, and the product is, in a way, a byproduct of that relationship. A relationship comes first, the product comes second. You can't sell the product until you've got the relationship. Funnily enough, there's nothing new about that. Any salesman knows that you have to have the relationship with people. It's just that it's sort of gotten on steroids at this point. And, and um, uh, so we have to have different strategies to do with it. There's a whole science that has um, now grown up uh, around this idea of studying choice. Um, and, and these kinds of tran transactions. Um, David Brooks recently wrote a column, I think it was last week, um, and he calls it the protocol uh, economy, um, where the stuff isn't so important. It's what you do with the stuff or how you tell people to, to use the stuff that's important. He says, economic change is fomenting intellectual change, and when the economy was about stuff, economics resembled physics, science. When it's about ideas, economics comes to resemble psychology. And so it's important to understand the, the psychology. Barry Schwartz is a sociology, uh, sociologist who studies uh, the science of choice, believe it or not. And he's done some really interesting research in how it is that people make their cultural choices. Listen for just a second. I'm going to start that over again because I'd like to get the sound a little higher. On flavor, and you bought them, and they. F okay. One last time. <laughs> Escalation of expectations. This hit me when I went to replace my jeans. I wear jeans almost all the time. And there was a time when jeans came in one flavor, and you bought them, and they fit like crap, and they were incredibly uncomfortable. And if you wore them long enough and washed them enough times, they started to fit, feel OK. So I went to replace my jeans after years and years of wearing these old ones. And I said, I you know, want a pair of jeans. Here's my size. And the shopkeeper said, do you want slim fit, easy fit, relaxed fit? Do you want button fly or zipper fly? you want stone washed or acid washed? Do you want them distressed? Do you want boot cut? Do you want tapered, blah, 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 on and on. He went, my jaw dropped. And after I recovered, I said, I want the kind that used to be the only kind. <laughs> he had no idea what that was. So I spent an hour trying on all these damn jeans, and I walked out of the store, truth, with the best fitting jeans I had ever had. I did better. All this choice made it possible for me to do better. But I felt worse. Why? 
I wrote a whole book to try to explain this to myself. The reason is... <laughs> the reason I felt worse is that with all of these options available, my expectations about how good a pair of jeans should be went up. I had very low ex I had no particular expectations when they only came in one flavor. When they came in a hundred flavors, damn it, one of them should have been perfect. And what I got was good, but it wasn't perfect. And so I compared what I got to what I expected, and what I got was disappointing in comparison to what I expected. Adding options to people's lives can't help but increase the expectations people have about how good those options will be. And what that's going to produce is less satisfaction with, with results, even when they're good results. It looks so great, I can't Nobody wait to Nobody in be the world of marketing knows this. Because if they did, you wouldn't all know what this was about. The truth is more like this. The reason that everything was better back when everything was worse is that when everything was worse, it was actually possible for people to have experiences that were a pleasant surprise. Nowadays, the world we live in, we affluent industrialized citizens, with perfection, the expectation, the best you can ever hope for is that stuff is as good as you expect it to be. You will never be pleasantly surprised because your expectations, my expectations, have gone through the roof. The secret to happiness, this is what you all came for. The secret to happiness is low expectations. <laughs> it's, it's a wedding and they're saying, you'll do. <laughs> Okay, so you're an arts organization. You want to do something a little risky, so maybe something your audience isn't comfortable with. They're coming expecting what? They're paying $100 for a ticket expecting what? Perfection. You don't deliver on that, what happens? They're disappointed. They're always going to be disappointed. <laughs> right? It's impossible to please these people. So. The product can't be the central part of the experience anymore. It has to be the, the, the entire experience of having a relationship with you. Oh, by the way, you'll notice that there's a phone number up at the top here. I kind of spaced, but um, if you have questions along the way, this is my cell phone number, and text me. And I promise I'll stop in the middle and I'll answer your question, okay? <laughs> In the, in the spirit of being interactive. <laughs> what this really is is a crisis of constituency. You have to build a constituency around what it is that you do. A group of people, a community of people who believe in what you do, who believe it's important to have a relationship with you. And if you can't build enough of a constituency to support you, then you're not going to do very well. Here's why. On online ads. Online ads are shown billions of times a day. But the success of them has been going down and down and down. Why? Because there's so much. People just start to tune it out. In fact, the click-through rate is 0.10% on average. That means for every thousand times an ad is shown, only one person clicks on it. That means that they have to be compelled to want to see something to a pretty specific level, or they're just going to tune it out. And that's our coping mechanism, is as the, the, the flood of content increases, uh, people start to tune out more and more and more. So, but there's also an opportunity in there as well, which I'll talk about in a second. So, I saw a statistic that said that the average symphony orchestra in America reaches about 2.5% of its population, local population. 2.5%. Now, do the math in this sort of one click per 1,000 people. That's an awful lot of heavy lifting for somebody to, for, for this small 2.5% to, uh, to support an orchestra, right? And 
a lot of these people are getting kind of tired. What we have to do, therefore, is to increase the reach of our constituency and have relationships with more people. Now, we talked about this for years and years and pops concerts and all this kind of thing. Of, but in the mass culture model, the way you had to reach people was to not dumb it down, but to go to that sort of center place, right? It's the mushy middle where every, the most people can relate to it. And it files off a lot of the things, the very things that our most devoted uh, uh, followers want to get out of the experience. But because we've moved away from the mass culture experience into niche culture, where everybody is consuming niches and they can have whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, and very, very specifically tailored to them, the way that audience is gathering up now is no longer in that mushy middle. As I showed you in the beginning, they're rejecting that. What they want is very specific um, experiences that speak to them directly. That's tailor-made for people who are making art that has a point of view, that has integrity, that has quality to it. And so rather than having to dumb down and go to the mushy middle, the way to success in the niche culture is to give people more specifically what it is that they want. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the, in the beginning, or in, in the next little section here. So who are these people and what do they want? This is a um, chart that shows the average consumption of an American uh, per day. And you can see that the average American watches 4.9, almost five hours of TV a day, two hours of radio, on the phone for almost an hour. Computer has a lot, computer games. You know, video games now have, have bigger audiences, bigger communities than movies and music combined. Interactive. The average person born in 1990 has now watched 50,000 hours of television. 50,000 hours of television. And what is it we say about television? Television is a passive experience. There's great television, but it's really essentially a passive, um, a, a, a passive experience. And so it's probably not so surprising that these people who've grown up with massive amounts of television want something else. They want an interactive experience. They want something. And we actually know quite a bit at this point, 15 years into the internet, about how it is that young people choose the culture that they choose. This uh, next section is from a couple of studies from the Curb Center, Bill Ivey's um, Stephen Tepper, and Stephen Tepper's um, uh, place at, at Vanderbilt University, and the USC Annenberg School Center for the Digital Future, which is De Jeff Cole. And what they found in asking people uh, in the 12 to 24 demographic uh, how it is that they decided what culture they wanted to consume. And they said the community is at the center of their internet experience. They want to go and join into community. They trust unknown peers more than experts. Death to critics. <laughs> um, it's the first generation that watches less television than the one before and they prefer the online experience to television because they can have a relationship with people around it. They use social networks to communicate. They don't use email because they think that's for their parents and it's clunky. <laughs> uh, they Facebook each other. They social network each other. That's, they, they want that instantaneous sense of being able to reach out to somebody and have somebody at the other end. Okay, so traditionally the way we make culture is we, we put on the concert, we send it out to the audience, and what happens? The audience applauds, and then they go home, and we don't actually really care what you do after that. Right? We hope that you had a good enough time, so you're going to come back, but we don't really know that. We can stand in the lobby and find out, but hmm. it's the kind of preacher experience, preaching to the crowd. So we started having an interactive experience. This is the newspaper experience. This is what a lot of people think interactive is, right? I make the thing, I send it out to you, and what happens? I give you the opportunity to talk back to me. So we have a conversation back and forth. That's pretty cool, except that's not really what um, interaction is, right? So we, we don't want to just go back and forth. Instead, interactive 
in the, in the next model is I make something. You come because it's interesting to you, but I make it possible for you who are there for a specific reason to meet other people who are there for a specific reason and have interactions among yourself as well as with me. In other words, I'm at the center of a conversation that I've created and you've come because I've created that conversation, but you're the ones who are going to have it. That's a very different way of relating. Why is this important? Well, Facebook, uh, the 550 million people on Facebook, right? Um, Facebook was kind of late into the video, um, uh, into the video thing. Um, but in April, Facebook members watched 30 billion videos. Average time of four minutes. The same time they uploaded 20 million. And that number is double what it was the month before because Facebook started allowing you to do it from your video or from your, from your cell phone, right? Um, I would be really, really surprised if by this time next year that number isn't 200 or 500 million videos uploaded. People want to respond in some sort of creative way. In fact, there were 25 billion pieces of content. That's comments, you know, whatever you want to name as, as, as content that were shared with friends. This is a viral epidemic <laughs> of, of, uh, of sharing, people wanting to interact with one another. They don't want to just pass along information. They want to have some sort of relationship with it. Now we all talk about the sort of mythical kind of, you know, power of viral marketing, right? This is the best graphic I've ever seen to kind of explain exactly how that works, right? This is a social network called LinkedIn. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Quite a few. Okay. This person has 334 um, colleagues, followers, friends, um, and that's, that's sort of an average. Um, if you were able to create a message that was so compelling that every, and you sent it out to your 334 friends, and it was so compelling that each one of them sent it to all of their friends, just in one click you've reached 84,000 people. Now, say it was the cutest cat video in the world. <laughs> so cute that all of their friends sent it to all of their friends. Within two clicks, you've reached three and a half million people. It doesn't take much. And a seasoned brochure does what? I'm not arguing that you shouldn't, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have seasoned brochures, but this is just, you know, I mean, phenomenal in the way. So it's really important that you figure out how to use this stuff in ways that provoke people to act in ways that you would like them to act, right? For their benefit and for yours. Okay, five opportunities. Art is a process rather than a product. Clay Shirky is a uh, NYU professor of uh, journalism, and um, he has done a lot of thinking about how people trade information. If, uh, he wrote a book a couple of years ago called Here Comes Everybody. Uh, if you haven't read it, I really highly recommend it. Uh, it talks about breakdown of institutions. It talks about the new crowdsourcing. It talks about a lot of the dynamics of, of how people are interacting with one another. And he coined this term about six months ago call, uh, 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 called algorithmic authority. And the principle is kind of simple. Um, the act of journalism, sub out art, the act of artistic process, is not complete until the audience that you have given it to decides to do something with it. And it goes one further. It's not uh, the responsibility of the community itself to manage that response. It's your responsibility to set up something so that they want to do something with it, right? This is actually a really, really old idea. It's how hits get made, right? <laughs> People start telling their friends, and 
um, you've got an audience that's decided to do something. It's just we haven't been able to measure it very specifically before. We actually have a way of measuring this now. 1992, the Boston Globe wrote a, a, a blockbuster story about a priest who had um, molested uh, boys. It was a huge story in Boston. Um, and it lasted for a couple of months, and the priest was reassigned someplace, and it, it, was, a, it was a terrible story. Then it died down. In 2002, 10 years later, they wrote essentially exactly the same story, different priest, same story. This time, that story became the most, the Boston Globe is, is owned by the New York Times. It became the most read story in the history of the New York Times company, by far, by far, by far. And it led to this huge scandal that nearly brought down the Catholic Church in, in um, uh, New England. Uh, what was different? wasn't the skill of the reporters or the way of telling the story. In 1992, the internet really didn't exist for all intents and purposes for everybody. But in 2002, what people did was when they read this story, they formed groups. They started talking to each other. They organized. They started getting other people's stories. They posted stories about that. They propelled that story to the next level. In other words, they enabled that story to be effective in a way that it could not have been effective 10 years earlier. That's the power of the community to be able to complete the artistic process or the journalistic process. So what he says is that you need to create algorithmic value for a piece of art or a piece of journalism is you need attention capital, i.e. you need to be out there and able to get somebody's attention, however it is that you get their attention. Two, you need reputational capital. In other words, you, I'm not going to listen to you if I don't trust you. So I have to have some sort of trust relationship with you. And finally, you need community capital. You need those people who are interacting with you to be part of a community that is larger than themselves and which enables them to algorithmically multiply. And which in turn gives power to the original impulse of art or journalism. It's a really powerful way of, of thinking about how you empower a community around you. Number two, it's all about constituency in the attention economy. If you can't reach enough people to, and, and get them to use whatever it is or see whatever it is or hear whatever it is that you're trying to uh, produce, then you're not going to be around for very long. So, you have to have a strategy for, for building constituency. Uh, Cory Doctorow is an author of science fiction um, books. Uh, he's also a thinker about the, the internet and, and, and models for it. And he says the reason they're not reading you is not that they don't like what you have to say, it's that they don't know what you have to say. Um, Seth Godin, who's a, a, a terrific mar marketer, and if, if you don't know his blog, it's called Seth's Blog, uh, it's a wonderful little thing. Every day is sort of like thought of the day. He's got a great way of thinking about um, uh, marketing and community. And a few years ago, he wrote a book, uh, and he went to his publisher, and he said, I want to put it for free on my website. The publisher said, that's really stupid. I want to make money off this. And so he did it himself. He bought some crappy software. He put it up there. The first month, 20 people downloaded it. By the third month, there were about 10,000 people. Two years ahead, it had been downloaded two million times. Now, in the meantime, he released it as a paper book, and it went to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Now, why? Because he removed all the barriers for people to, to, to be able to sample it. They did. They started a relationship with him so that the next time there was an opportunity to have an interaction with him, they trusted him. They said, I want to find out what this guy has to say. Right? Um, Corey just put out a new book. He gives away all of his books for free online. The latest book has 30 different versions, however. You can get it for free on his website, but you can also get a copy of it for $20,000. Who's going to pay $20,000 for a book? Well, guess what? There's only five copies of it. And if you get to them and you, sell, you get to the, to, to the pre-sale before it happens, 
he'll make you a character in his book. And you get a bound copy signed by the author. That's pretty cool if you're a fan of Corey's, right? And in between, there are all sorts of different versions. There's the hardback version and the, you know, many, many different levels. And what he's interested in doing is figuring out what is the value add that he can make to maximize the community around him. Um, Kevin Kelly, who writes a blog called Technium, has this idea. You all know about the long tail, right? Um, this idea that, you, that, that to be successful in the mass culture, you had to sell a million of one thing. But to be successful in the digital culture, you can, it's, it's just as good to sell a mil, uh, uh, one copy of a million things, right? Because it doesn't cost to produce anything more. What he says is that almost any enterprise you can imagine, if you can find a thousand fans, a thousand two, true fans who are willing to support you, you can make a go of it. This is how Arts Journal works a little bit. Um, we have uh, about 40,000. Uh, subscribers to our free newsletters, but we also offer a premium newsletter. Bet you didn't know that, huh? <laughs> um, a thousand people pay money to get the newsletter. Now, for the premium newsletter, you get the description of the story along with the link, and you can sort of scan it as a digest, which I guess is sort of useful, but honestly, you could go to the website and get exactly the same thing without having to pay it. Why is somebody going to pay $28 for that? Well, yeah, there's some convenience to getting it in your um, mailbox every morning. But there are also a lot of people out there who sort of like what we do and they want to find ways to support us. So actually what a lot of companies are doing now is instead of selling products, they're selling memberships to a community. Right? That's what public radio does. Only 9%, you're, you're considered successful in public radio if you can get 9% of your audience to give you money. Why would they give you money when they can listen for free? They believe in you. They know that without your help, they're not going to survive. And it's important to you. Unfortunately, in orchestras, we don't give people a whole lot of ways to support us. There's usually one or two, or maybe three ways. Why aren't there 50 or 60 ways? And why don't we value them in different ways? There's a whole economy growing on this. It's called the freemium model. In iTunes, you create the free version of the app, right? A million people download it. They have a relationship with you. Then you offer a version that does some extra thing. Now I have a relationship with you. I'm really happy with this app. I'll pay 99 cents. There's a lot of software now that, that runs this. This is becoming the dominant model in the software business. Number three, rethink your relationships. Okay, so I have a proposition here. If I give you $1,000, if I give your orchestra $1,000, what are you going to do for me? I'm going to put my name in the program. I get to have drinks with the music director. Well, maybe not for $1,000. But you're going to treat me specially. You'll take me backstage. You'll make me feel really quite nice. What if I buy $1,000 worth of tickets? And actually, I'm such a big fan of yours that I go to every single thing that you do. How are you going to reward me? You're going to say, well, we gave you these wonderful concerts. Well, that's true. But you know what my other reward is? Six months from now, somebody's calling me up and saying, hey, did you know that, that ticket, those tickets that you bought only covered 30% of the cost of doing it? Wouldn't you like to give us some more money? I'm from Seattle. If I went to a, uh, when I go to a baseball game, if at the end of the se season the Mariners call me up and say, hey, you know, <laughs> we didn't quite cover Ken Griffey's salary this year. <laughs> wouldn't you like to give us a few more dollars? I'd be pissed off. I, they wouldn't think about doing that. But why is that all right to do in the arts? I would submit that the person who gives you $1,000 worth of tickets is exponentially more important to you than the person who gives you a $1,000 donation. Because they're such a fan, they want to have a relationship with you. And if you are able to motivate them properly, they'll go out and do amazing things for you. They really will. And, um, and yet, that's not how we do it. For instance, you know, to get better seats. How do you get better seats? You pay more money, right? Why is it all just about money? Shouldn't there be like a little section re reserved for people who 
brought 10 friends with them, or people who've been coming to every concert for the last 20 years, or people who've gone out and talked you up in some way, or we have all sorts of ways of being able to encourage and measure that activity now. Why can't we create a level of engagement? Remember I, I, I showed you that chart at the beginning that was about measuring engagement of an audience rather than demographics of an audience. If you can set up a ladder of engagement where the, the incentives are aligned to participate more and more in the organization and do things, you're going to have a much stronger community. And you're not selling the product by the time the concert comes around, they're coming to the concert because it's what you do as a community. That's really significant. It's really important. I would also suggest that our relationships inside our organizations are really screwed up. In the traditional model, the institution is at the top here. All the glory to the institution. And the institution uses its resources to present the artist. So the artist feeds into the institution. The institution gives whatever it is to the audience. But it's all about the institution. In this equation, the audience is largely invisible. We think of them as consumers rather than partners. We think of them as people who buy things rather than people who want to have relationships with us. They're partners. So they, in this model, don't really factor into the public life of the institution. Instead, I would propose this kind of model, where the institution is below and it acts as an infrastructure to support artists and everything that the artists do, Right? Not just what they contribute to you, but they, you use their res your resources to support all of their artistic activities. Why would you do that? You do that because it makes happier artists. Artists who are partners uh, will work for the institution because it's important to them because it benefits everybody. Now, it benefits them as employees, too. But it's a different kind of relationship if you're a partner. And it also supports the audience. It makes the audience visible to one another. It, puts, it elevates the audience to a, an equal level here. So it's a recognition that the audience is as important or more important because they actually help make all of this possible. And in fact, they can contribute some really valuable things. That doesn't mean that you give up your artistic integrity or give up all of your control to the mob, what it means is that you're a center of a discussion about culture rather than a dictator of culture. That's a really significant difference. And it's in, it's in tune with all of this kind of interactive behavior that we're now seeing. People want to have relationships. They don't want to be consumers. It also starts to give you freedom. It means that you actually have to start acting in a way that's oddly uninstitutional. Right? This is a, a, an organization called On the Boards in Seattle. And um, they weren't getting a whole lot of press attention, so they wanted to figure out what they could, what they could do. Right? Um, so they decided to invite their audience onto a blog they would identify three or four really interesting people that they knew as part of their core audience and give them free tickets and in return come and review the show the next morning. Now what happened was really interesting because um, they got really interesting perspectives that critics for the most part weren't providing because the critics that the newspapers were sending really didn't understand this work. So you had architects reviewing dancers and dancers reviewing you know, I mean, it's it, it, a very interesting perspective. It became uh, a, a kind of creative forum for them. But when they were setting it up, the first thing they said was, well, what if somebody comes on and says mean things about us? OK, so if you do a show, you know not all your shows are good. I mean, all your shows are good, but not all your shows are good, right? <laughs> you know this. So when your audience comes, do you think they think everything you do is great? Probably not. 
So what happens when they have an experience of something and it isn't great? What do they do? They go home. They tell their friends. They might complain about it. They might stew about it, not even tell anybody. But what happens? You have no idea. You have no idea. You don't have a relationship with them. So why not bring that negative energy onto your own site where you can see it? Any really good salesman will tell you that some of their best customers are people who come first with a complaint. People want to be heard. They want you to pay attention to them. And if you give them a place, now you have the possibility of having a relationship with them in a way that was largely invisible before. Okay, number four, be the infrastructure rather than the product. I sort of talked about this a little bit, um, but it, it, it's an actually larger thing. Um, you could also express it as sell the aesthetic rather than the concert. Um, here's an example of, you know, Doritos. Um, the Super Bowl isn't just the Super Bowl of football, it's also the, the Super Bowl of ads, right? The best ad agencies create the best ads, they pay a lot of money, and people pay attention to these ads in a big way. So this last time, Doritos decided, Frito-Lay decided to do something different. They decided to have a contest. They bought four spots on the Super Bowl, and they, they made an announcement, anybody create our ads for us and submit them online. And we'll pay, the, 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 the community will vote and pick the top four. And we'll, we'll run those ads. And the four who win will each get $20,000. But if any of those four ads uh, are the most popular ad on the Super Bowl, they get a million dollars. And if all four are in the top 10, we'll give a million dollars to all four. Right? That's a pretty big incentive. Interesting what happened. The number one, this is the final six, the number one most watched ad in Super Bowl history was one of the Doritos ads, contributed by viewers, by, by what is it, eaters, I guess. <laughs> um, and all four got into the top ten. Um, it got downloaded like a million times. Here's a little sample of one of them. Hey, dog. Anti-bark collar. You want a Dorito? You gotta speak. Huh? Speak. Oh, come on. Now imagine you're the big ad agency and, and there's millions of dollars riding on this and some guy sitting on his sofa in Des Moines, Des Moines Iowa came up with this and he's now a million dollars richer, right? Over and over and over again we're starting to see the community being able to accomplish things for a company that it couldn't accomplish itself. Harley Davidson is a really good example of this. Harley was in the toilet but there was a community that formed around it that the company didn't create. The company encouraged it, but the, co the, 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 the people themselves defined what it means to be a Harley rider. This is a site called Patients Like Me. Hard to, if, if you have a disease, you come onto this site and you contribute all your information, except your name. And it's created the largest group of, of um, ALS uh, patients. The site then sells the information to studies that are trying to, but you also get to measure yourself against other patients and their experience, et cetera. So there's so many benefits in the, in the power of the crowd to be able to do these things. Um, I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'm going to speed through a little bit. This is the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And what they decided to do is, is, you know, they've got a pretty decent collection, but it's not a, a, an incredible collection. 
And so if you go into any one exhibit there, uh, you're only going to get part of what the aesthetic of that uh, museum is. And so uh, what they decided to do is to not sell the shows, but sell the aesthetic. So they created this site called Art Babel. And they put up every artist that they are really interested in. And um, um, now you can go, and if you're interested in Bryce Martin here, this is the place to go and find out as much about him. Now when they have a show of Bryce Martin, their audience knows the context. They're so familiar with him because it is the aesthetic that people have bought into. The, the, the show that they do, the exhibition that they do, the concert that you do, is only an incremental expression of that aesthetic. It's a brand strategy, yeah, it's an old time brand strategy, but it's very effective in setting context for a community. Finally, promote a, con a culture of failure. We don't fail enough, and yet we learn a lot from failures. Pixar is the most successful movie studio ever. It's never had a flop. It makes hundreds of millions of dollars. And people are always trying to figure out why it is. The director of Toy, of Toy Story 3, which is about to, about to come out, says it's important that nobody gets mad at you for screwing up. We know screw ups are an essential part of making something good. That's why our goal is to screw up as fast as possible. Right? In fact, they have exercises in screwing up fast because that's how they learn to do things wrong. They want to push. They want to push. The head of product development for Procter & Gamble, when he first came on, their success rate for new products was very high. He pushed it down. He pushed it down because it's important to fail because that's where you learn things. Um, Penn State teaches a class in it for engineers on failure. It's failure 101. And you don't get an A until you fail a lot. <laughs> it also allows you to become transparent. The Indianapolis Museum, they decide, OK, if we're going to have a relationship with you, we're going to put everything we do out there. You can ask us anything. This is a website that they have. And it tells you how many kilowatt hours they burn of electricity every day. It tells you how many trees they planted. How, it tells you how many people came through the museum that day. And it tells you what the value of their endowment was as the close of business yesterday. They don't know how people are going to use this information, but they do know that it has significantly changed the relationship that they have with them because it's treating people like partners. And it's important for those people to know. Barack Obama campaign was the same way by bringing people in and allowing them to create pages on their site and make their own cases for why they supported him. Very difficult thing to do, but it was wildly successful. Time Inc., giant Time Inc., they just got rid of their litigation attorney, their libel litigation attorney last month, retired. First time in 35 years they don't have a single libel case against them. They haven't for the last 11 months. Um, New York Times, currently a year without any libel cases. Why? Because now people can talk to them and they can make their case, and they listen, and they can make the changes when necessary. It's a real change in the way people are relating. Somebody just asked if um, uh, I'm going to make this PowerPoint available. Yes, I will. Um, I'm going to put it online. Um, and I think the League has all your email addresses. Yeah, and I will put it up online and, and give you the URL. New York Times now has, they televise. They webcast their morning editorial meetings. So you can go on and you can see reporters arguing for why this story is more important than that story. Why would you do that? This is unheard of for a newspaper. But it's important. Google gives its engineers 20% of their time where they can do anything they want, any pro project that they want, because they know the ability to fail, the ability to play, the ability to do something that's important to you makes a better worker the rest of the time. And guess what the bonus is? Some of their best products in the last five years have come out of projects that were started in that 20%. And because they make their employees partners in this process and give them some control, it changes the relationship. We can have to do that in the arts. OK, I leave you with this concerning failure. 
Alexander Graham Bell arguably invented one of the most important pieces of technology of all time, the telephone. But he spent most of his life feeling like a failure for the telephone. He thought that the telephone was a failure. He thought that this marvelous invention of his was going to be the way that people were going to have only the most exalted conversations. <laughs> because it's an amazing thing, right? In fact, he dictated that when you called somebody, you didn't say hello or hi, how vulgar, you said ahoy. <laughs> and the fact that they didn't convinced him that the telephone was the biggest failure of his entire life. The lesson is, is that you can never predict what your audience, how your audience is going to use something that you create. But you have to give them the opportunity to be able to create something that you couldn't ever have imagined. It comes from you, but it exists in a bigger sphere because they decided to do something with it. Thank you very much.